the place your mud frog Have you counted? Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost? If your soul should be lost So you get Sunday message today, we shall have a brief period of scripture reading. The Gospel according to St. John. The Gospel according to St. John. John 8. John 8. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. 
But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go, and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come, and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury, as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house for ever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. 
Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews, and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory, there is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. May God help us to be doers of the word. Amen.
its mightiest works shall perish, shall crumble and decay. The falls of bricks and granite, the years shall slip away, but souls live on forever in joy or misery. And character is destined to last eternally. worship service today. Thank you for your goodness, your power. Thank you for your presence here. We're asking, Lord, that your word will reach every heart in Jesus' name. And today will be a day of blessing, every form of blessing for everyone. We're asking, Lord, open all our hearts, touch our hearts, transform our hearts, transform our lives to meet with you and to meet with all the goodness of the Lord in our lives in Jesus' name. Confirm your blessing of ev on everyone without exception. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the good people of God said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can see down today. We're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I'm reading from verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Reading from verse 1. And it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do. To observe 
and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth and then in verse 2 it tells us and all these blessings shall come upon thee upon me and overtake thee if 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 thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the lord thy god and then in verse 3 it tells us blessed shall thou be in the city and blessed shalt thou be in the field. In verse 4, it says, Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, your children, and the fruit of thy ground, your produce, and the fruit of thy cattle. And then it says, The increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. In verse 5, it tells us, It says, Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Look at verse 7 there. In verse 7 it said, Then the Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. Thou shalt come out, they shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. In verse 8 it says, in verse 8, the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses. And in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself as he has sworn unto thee. If thou, look at that word, if, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Verse 10 says, oh, And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. Are you hear a good amen there? In verse 11, verse 11 says, And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, and the Lord, and it says, and the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. Verse 12 there says, The Lord shall open unto thee, unto me, his good treasure, the heaven to give thee the rain into thy land in a season and to bless all the work of thine hand. All, all the work of thine hand and thou shalt lend to many nations and thou shalt not borrow. And then it says in verse 13, And the Lord shall make thee the head, the head, the head. I think I need to explain that. When it says the head, you know, when you think of the head, that's where all blessings, all things that we do, that's where it comes from. If the, if the head is dull, life will be dull. If the head is a kind of retarded, dull, weak, not having ability to learn and to retain, life will be shallow. But when you have a good head, I'm talking about you. And when you have a brilliant head, I'm talking about you today, it says, it shall not be like, you know, the head is down and you cannot give control and command to the rest of the body. I'm praying that this year, our people here, there, everywhere, where, wherever you are, the Lord will make you the head. Now, now. If the Lord is going to make you the head, you must not lose your head. 
Once you lose your head, you have lost everything. The head. In control of the whole body. In control of life. In control of progress. In control of every good thing the Lord has said before you. Lose your head and you lose everything else. That's why people, when they watch you, you take this action, you take this action, and they know that the way you are going, you're likely to end in the ditch. And they know it's because of things happening around you. That's why your head is here, your head is there, your head is there, your head is there. You see, man, be careful. Don't lose your head. And they say, woman, look at your family and look at things you are doing. Don't lose your head. And I want to tell the church, this year, whatever happens around you, whatever does not happen around you, just, just look and see. Just wait and see. Everything will soon be all right. And so don't lose your head. Tell the person by your side, look at them, don't lose your head. Now, in the Christian life, when we say head, H, holiness. Don't lose your holiness. Once you lose your holiness, you've lost the head. And you've lost the edge, the cutting edge, where God is sending you. E, don't lose your excellence. If you are excellent, then be moving on and be moving up and be progressing every time. You know, once you lose your excellence, you know, something happens. Let's say you're a good uh, kind of, a good engineer. And the people who are walking around you, they, they do something like this and all that. You say, what, what about, okay, if that's the case, then let's drop the excellence that we're being pursuing. And once you do that, the people don't know the reason why you're no more excellent, you're no more extraordinary. They think it's your fault. They don't think it's the fault of the people around you, your head, your holiness, and your excellence. Don't lose your anointing. If you happen to be a preacher, if you happen to be a Christian, if you happen to be a believer, there is an anointing upon you. And if you are not going to lose your head, you'll not lose your holiness, you will not lose your excellence. It is for the anointing. You'll not lose your anointing. Now, people are known for distinctives. You look at Moses and the rod in his hand, you can know that's his distinctive. And then you look at Joshua and you look at him saying, Son, stand up there, stay there. That's his own peculiar uh, distinctive. You don't find any other person doing that. And then you look at Isaiah and you find him saying, Go tell Ezekiah. That man, Sennacherib, that is coming, it will not go back by the same way. And then 185 soldiers were killed in one night. You don't find that with everybody. Every preacher, every pastor, every prophet, and every professional, everyone has his distinctives. And so when he says, he'll make you the head, it's not just talking about head, it's talking about your holiness. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It's talking about excellence. That's what Daniel had. He had an excellent spirit. And then your anointing and your distinctives. So the Lord will make you the head. A good amen. amen. And remember, don't lose your head. Holiness, excellence, anointing, distinctive. I'm looking at verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee the head, and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if thou wilt shalt hack him unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. Amen.
Today we're talking on the complete possession of our covenant blessings. The complete possessions of our, of our covenant blessings. Three things we're looking at. Look at number one here. Number one, the conditional promise from our covenant benefactor. He benefits us. He is our benefactor. And he gives us a covenant and from him we have the promises attached to the covenant. But those promises, as you look at them very closely and as you look at them wanting to possess them and wanting to preserve them in your life, those promises of the covenant are conditional. Number one, the conditional promise from our covenant benefactor. Number two, is the conferred privilege of covenant keeping believers. The believers who look at the covenant of God and they look at the conditions and they want to have the privilege of having the fulfillment, the conferred privilege of covenant keeping believers. Number three is the courageous prayer of all covenant keeping beneficiaries. The, the prayer we pray, not, not the ground level prayer, and not the ordinary prayer, not the usual prayer, not the repeated prayers we have always prayed. Every time we pray, we start the same way and go on, asking the same thing and ending up the same way. Whatever message we hear, and whatever challenge we have, and whatever new conviction God plants in our hearts, we keep on praying the same, not that kind of prayer, courageous prayer of all the covenant keeping beneficiaries let's come to number one number one is the conditional promise of our covenant benefactor we're looking at exodus chapter 19 and verse 5 as you look at all these verses we're going to look at here you'll find the word if that's the condition if you do this then i will do that if if the man the woman the boy the girl if he does this then i the almighty i will do this you're looking at divine human partnership and relationship and god says the covenant and he says if the human on earth will do this then i in heaven this is what I will do. Notice that word in your Bible. Every time you read a promise, every time you read whatever God has said that he will do, you look at that word, A. Look at Exodus now. Exodus chapter 19. We're reading from verse 5. Exodus 19, 5. Now, therefore, if ye will obey, my voice indeed and keep my covenant then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine he wants to lift you up above all the people you know all the people around you all the people in your immediate circle of a relationship yet it says I want to lift you up. I can do it. That's what I want to do. That's my will. And that's my passion for you. But there is a condition. If ye will obey my voice indeed, then I will keep and keep my covenant. Then it shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the others might look at verse 6 in verse 6 and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation and look at uh, chapter 23 exodus 23 we're looking at verse 22 in exodus 23 verse 22 but if you see that it's conditional we cannot just come and say god bless me bless me bless me and the lord will say my son my daughter obey me obey me obey me and then you say god forget about that i don't have intention to obey i don't have intention to live a righteous life i don't like holiness but i love healing and then god says now you want to make me your servant Go ahead and bless me. Go ahead and heal me. Go ahead and do that. Promote me. 
but you are not willing to look at the condition he says hey thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that i speak then i will be an enemy to thine enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries then in verse 23 it tells us it says for mine angel capital a mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the amorites and the hittites and the Perizzites and the gan and the canaanites and the hivites and the jebusites and i will cut them off Verse 24, in verse 24 you says, Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt surely, utterly, this overthrow them and quite break down their images. Is that a condition? You are not in partnership with unbelievers. We're sinners, we're rebellious people, we're disobedient people, and we're the people that take themselves as an idol. You're not supporting their idol worship, and you're not supporting their hero worship. You support the word of God, and you support Christ, the very Son of God. You will not bow down to anyone's image, Nebuchadnezzar's image, or Pharaoh's image, if you'll be obedient to the word of the Lord, then he says, this is what you'll look at, verse 25, in verse 25, and ye shall serve the Lord thy God. You don't serve yourself. When you are happy, you render a good service. When you are not happy, then you render a kind of worthless service. You are not serving God, you are serving self. And the condition of self, and the condition of your body, and the condition of your family determines the kind of service you render. That's not serving God, but it says that you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Remember if you obey his voice in Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 7 we're looking at verse 12. If ye, look at that, if the conditions are always there. And if you just rush ahead, rush ahead, pray, 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 pray. And then, you know, prayer is the key. Obedience is the key. Following after the Lord and fulfilling the condition is the key. They, you know, they deceive us with well, that kind of singing. Pray the key, pray the key. Uh, Jesus prayed in the morning, prayed at noon, prayed everywhere. Prayer is the key. Sinners pray. Prayer is not their key. Repentance is their key. And church people pray. Prayer is not the key. Obedience is the key. It says, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which is swear unto thy fathers. In verse 15, it says in verse 15, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness give me a good amen there and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee but he will lay them upon them that hate thee another amen Deuteronomy chapter 28 I'm reading from verse 1 it says and it shall come to pass, if thou, if thou, if thou. I wonder why people who read the Bible, 
and they say they are in a Bible believing church. I wonder why and how they omit the condition and they take away that faith. And then they go to the rest of the verse. They're looking for blessings, uh, you know, they're looking for the blessing of Moses upon the action of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They're looking for the blessings of the obedient and faithful apostles uh, from, and they're living the life of an apostate who can't do that. That if is very important on a, at a time like this when we're considering the covenant of the Lord, it says very clearly there, and it shall come to pass if thou not they forget about what they do if you are looking for the blessing of god if you are searching that the blessings of god will be upon you if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the lord thy god and observe to do all his commandments which i command thee this day that the lord thy god will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth now the church is um, a nation that's what you find in the new testament it's made us a holy nation and so we can think of this church and say this is a holy nation we can think about another church whatever the name nation 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 now all those churches nation 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 the reason god will bless any church any gathering any assembly is if thou shalt hacking diligently unto the voice of the lord thy god to observe and to do all the commandments which i command thee this day but now our members ministers workers leaders sometimes we have to be uh, not really that we're you know going to the other place or the church to go and borrow anything or kind of transplant anything to deeper life but maybe somebody is doing something and we have to go there an event is happening maybe sometimes we just have to go there and then we see something there and then you see it looks like these people they are not totally following everything you think like that at first and then later you think okay if that church is doing that why are we not doing it the reason we're do not doing it is because our blessing does not depend on copying this church copying that church copying that church our blessing conditional blessing conditional promise conditional power and conditional outpouring overflowing blessing of god is if thou shalt diligently hearken unto the voice of the lord thy god to observe and to do all that not all that we see over there all that we sense over there all that we hear those other people are doing it is if we do all this commandment which i command thee this day that the lord thy god will set thee on high above all the nations all the churches, all the gatherings, all the fellowships. Now, if everybody lowers the standard, every church, including Deep Alive, if we lower the standard and we're not thinking of the coming of the Lord, we're not thinking of the rapture, we're not thinking of what it takes to make it to heaven. And we're now at the same level, we'll be like, you know, the world will be trampling over us. We'll not have any distinctive any distinction, any difference between us and the world. And what happens to the world that God said, I will not put the diseases of the world of Egypt upon you. Then we find the same disease of the world rampant among us. Why? Because we're not noticing the condition and we're not distinguishing ourselves. We lose our head. We lose our holiness. We lose our excellence, what people know us for. 
we lose our anointing, the anointing that breaks every yoke. We lose our distinctives, and then we're just like sure the other people and the cockroaches and the serpents and the you know reptiles of a crawling over us. God forbid in Jesus' name. And it says, and it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hack him diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high. Somebody is saved as to be higher than somebody is a sinner. Somebody is sanctified as to be higher than the one who is only saved. And somebody is spirit filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost as to be higher than the person who is just saved and sanctified. That edge must be there, and that promotion should be there, and that advance, advancement should be there. And it says, I lift you high above all the nations of the earth. And then in verse 2, in verse 2, it says, And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Eighth. That word is there again. The condition is always there. When you are praying, if you have prayed and prayed and prayed and there's no answer, go back and check up. Am I omitting the condition? Is there something from the Lord I'm not carrying out? The way I ought to carry out is my heart departed from the Lord? Is my life kind of trampling down upon the word of God? It's as we check the condition. Whether we're fulfilling the condition or not, it's as we check all the things that precede the fulfillment of the promise of God that we find out if I am not keeping to that in small things, in big things. You know, some people say, you know, there's not a big deal. I know this is not right, but this is small. I know this is not right, but this is small. I know that's not right, but this is small. My brother, have you ever considered, my sister, have you ever considered that the lion does not kill thousands in a year in our continent, Africa? But the mosquito, this one doesn't matter. If I do my hand like that, the mosquito is gone. And yet that small thing kills millions of people all over the world with that malaria. You go to this place, they say, this one is malaria, this one is typhoid. You go to another place, that one is malaria, that is typhoid. Where do we get the malaria? And how is malaria killing so many people? More than a lion will kill, more than an elephant will kill, Big, big sins don't come away most of the time. If the little mosquito sin, if the little sin doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, that's what kills our spiritual lives. And that's what takes the blessings away from us. That's why he's saying, look at the condition, look at what God is saying, and look at those little, little foxes that spoil the vine. It says, all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hack him unto the voice of the Lord thy God. God. And then we're looking at uh, verse 6 there. Look at verse 6. It says in verse 6, Blessed shall thou be when thou goest out, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest, when thou comest and when thou goest out. And then in verse, uh, in verse 7, it says, The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God. God giveth thee, verse 9, in verse 9, that Lord shall establish thee and holy people, not just rich people, holy people, not just successful farmer, holy people, and it's not just progressive professional. He wants to establish us that will be holy people unto himself as he has sworn unto thee. If 
thou, if thou, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Verse 10, verse 10 says, and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee. Verse 11, in verse 11 it says, And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, and in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers uh, to give Unto, to give thee and then in verse 12 it says the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure and the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in a season and to bless all the work of thine hand and thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow remember that if if you don't bribe if you are not fraudulent, if you are not a thief, clever thief that will steal either from the office or will steal from the company or will steal in a dexterous way that nobody will know. Nobody will even suspect that that man, that woman can be a thief. If you are not stealing, if you are not fraudulent, if you are not playing internet fraud, if you are not doing any of the things that the Egyptians, the world that they are doing, it says, Hey, thou shall be obedient to the word of the Lord your God, then he will bless you above all the people that are stealing, all the people that are fraudulent. He will bless you above them in Jesus' name. And thou shalt not borrow, but will lend unto many people. But remember the eighth. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, and the Lord shall make thee the head. Holiness, excellence, anointing, distinctive. If a head is not distinctive, that's no head. If the head is a mediocre, that's not a head. If the head, so to say, is not anointed, and it doesn't have the courage, the passion, the power, it doesn't have the spiritual strength, that's not a head. If a head is rolling every time, you know, something happens, it doesn't have the self-control, it doesn't have the self-discipline, it doesn't have the mastery over where he is and the surrounding, that's not a head. If the head is timid and afraid every time, and the little, little puny pygmies can intimidate him or her, that's not a head. It's when somebody is lifted up by the Lord and then the Lord makes him a real head and you can tell that's a head. I'm pointing at you. I said you can tell that's a head. That's when somebody is a head. Well, if somebody is like, you know, ordinary, you can push there, push there, trampled upon, things will change in your life. It says, the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath if, that's the condition, if, if that thou hearken unto the, unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe, and to do them, verse 14, in verse 14, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, and to the right hand or to the left to go after all the gods to serve them. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, but if, if, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hack him. 
unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I commanded this day that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. You see the two sides. God is a good God, great God, balanced. If you obey, these are the blessings that will follow. If you disobey, no matter who you are, your name, your stature, your standing, and whatever I've done for you in the past, no matter who you are, it says for the children of Israel, if you will not act in, if you will not obey, this is what will come. I pray we we'll position ourselves in the place of blessing all the time in Jesus' name. And look at Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. We're reading from verse 16. It says, Wash you, the dirty hands, wash you. The dirty habits, wash you. The dirty environments, wash you. The dirty clothing, wash you. It says, wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. And then in verse 17, it says, learn to do well. Learn to do well. Learning takes effort. Learning takes concentration. Learning takes perseverance. Look at when we went to school, we tried to learn the alphabets. They were strange, but we still kept on until we could master those alphabets. We, try, we learned the words. Difficult, but we made it. We learned construction of sentences. Difficult. We made it. We learned writing an essay, composition. We made it eventually, and we learned a lot of things. But learning takes effort. It takes the mind. It takes the heart. I am going to learn. Why did we learn? Because you know, there were difficult subjects. We had to learn because we looked at the future. Our future when we finish school, our future when we graduate, and because we're looking at the future, I want to come out of this institution, school, primary, secondary, tertiary, university, college. I want to come out of this with a certificate. That's why we persevered. Now it says learn to do well. And sometimes, you know, our bad, our old bad habits will try to come back, but we we'll say, no, I'm going to learn. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to be diligent. Why? We're looking at the future. The future in heaven. We want to come out of this earth with a do well certificate. With a well done certificate that we know we came to this life where God saved and then we learned to do what's right according to what a child of God ought to do and then we also got sanctified and the sanctified life we have to persevere we have to focus and we have to resist temptation so as to keep to the learning of God the experience of God in salvation sanctification it takes focus it takes a mind. It takes something that says, I'm looking at the head. I'm looking at the time I leave this earth. You leave college and then you go to the next level. You go to heaven. That's why it says, learn to do well and seek judgment and relieve the oppressed and judge the fatherless and plead for the widows. Then it says in verse 18, in verse 18, it says, come now and let us reason together says the Lord though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow and though they be red like crimson they shall be as so look at verse 19 if 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 ye be willing and obedient all that he has told us to do that's the way of blessing and that's the way of receiving the good good things he has promised in the covenant if ye be willing and obedient he shall eat the good of the land somebody say good amen, amen. 
Look at verse 20 there. In verse 20, but if ye refuse, look at God. He says, if you be willing and obedient, oh God, can you force us to be, to be obedient? He says, no, I won't force anything. Can't you make us obedient? I've given you the grace. Once you are saved, you can do it. I've given you the anointing. If you're a child of God, you can do it. The, the anointing remains. If you want to obey, the strength is there. If you have the heart to obey, you'll find the strength is there to obey. So, if you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of them. But you have your choice. You're a free moral agent. You can obey, you can disobey. But there is consequence for obedience, there's consequence for disobedience. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be destroyed, devout with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. We're reading from verse 29. Acts chapter 5. Verse 29, Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. We were born again. We were sanctified. He prayed for our sanctification. And he said, Father, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. And because he prayed for sanctification, and he said, Father, I thank you, because you always hear me. The Lord God in heaven answered the prayer. And when, when you pray for salvation, you cannot just say, I'm saved, I'm saved. There must be a change in your life. The joy of salvation that comes and makes you to understand, makes you to know you are saved. When you are sanctified, there will be the evidence there that the Lord has sanctified you because he makes you free from the Adamic nature and free from the bad habits of the old life. He makes you so free and you know that this is the freedom that comes with sanctification. And when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, there is evidence. The power comes with an evidence. You know, I am sanctified. And that's what the Lord wants of us. These people said, we're saved, we're sanctified. We're even filled with the Holy Ghost now on what grounds? Look at verse 32. In verse 32, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God had given to them that obey him that obey him they were saved and so they could you know obey the lord in what way when the lord said he requires the past all the lies of the past go correct them and that will show the evidence you are saved all the things you have stolen in the past and you are masked there either you are using them or you are not using them but you stole them the Lord is saying return them to the owner Abimelech return to Abraham his wife it is you know when you are saved there will be something to show that you are obedient and it is that experience of salvation, that experience of sanctification, that experience of becoming a son of God, a daughter to God. It's that experience that brings the grace into your life and you become obedient to the Lord. And then you're not praying for the Holy Ghost baptism. You're saved. You have obedience that shows for it. Anything that wasn't tried to have dis dis discarded them and all the, all the um, restitution you need to make. And the, the Lord gives us the grace when we're saved. He gives us the grace when we're sanctified. And then you do that. And now you are asking for the Holy Ghost baptism. It says, whom the Lord has given to them that obey him. I'm going to ask you pointedly. Are there things you have stolen? Still in your possession? still in your house still hidden somewhere the blessings of god cannot come until you obey him are there things who are covering up 
and there are things you know you stay back there and then you are propelling other people and sending other people go and do evil go and do evil go and do evil except that is corrected you will remain like that without the fulfillment of the blessing of the lord he said he has given us the holy spirit he has given us the power he has given us the grace because what he gave us for us we obeyed him and now he continues to bless us because we continue to obey the word of the lord i pray the lord will grant you such obedience in Jesus name if I do that if I confess that if I obey that if I do that restitution what will people say there yeah, you are you are worshipping self you want to be looked at as a good man, as a good woman, when you know in your heart of hearts, you are a bad man. You are a thief and you are a backslider. But you want people to hold you high, look up at you high there. When you are down there, that's why you are not obeying the Lord. What will they say if I stop that? What will they think? Then they will know I was doing that in the past. I really don't want to continue now, but if I stop, they will think you are worshipping self. When you forget about self, and you forget about what people think, what people say, and you obey the Lord, whatever people think of you, would you rather have the respect of men here and go to hell? or lose the respect of men here and go to heaven that's where you stand it says he gave the holy ghost the holy spirit baptizing them because they had obeyed him we're looking at romans chapter 6 reading from verse 16 romans chapter 6 verse 16 know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants his servants ye are to whom ye obey. His servants ye are to whom ye obey. If Satan suggests something to you and you obey that, you are a servant of Satan. If the culture, the community, by what they do, they are fraud, that is the common thing now, where those who have some little understanding of, uh, you know, internet, and they, they do fraud, they do evil. If you obey what you see in the community, you are a servant of those people. It says, the, the servants ye am, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto right. Then in verse 17, it says, But God be thanked that ye were servants, were in the past servants of sin, then but ye have obeyed from the heart. I've obeyed from the heart. Not I service. I've obeyed from the heart. You have the conviction in your heart. This is the will of God. This is the word of God. And this is the way to go. By the dictates of the word of God. And then you obey from the heart. It says you have obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine which was delivered you. Verse 18. In verse 18. Being then made free from sin. Ye became the servants of righteousness look at chapter 16 of Romans I'm reading from verse 19 chapter 16 of Romans verse 19 for your obedience has come abroad unto all men I am glad therefore on your behalf but yet I would have you wise unto, the, unto that which is good and simple concerning evil that is ignorant of evil you don't even act as if you don't know evil what does that mean we know many words in the dictionary that even though we know them we act as we do, as if we don't know them how we don't use them we forget about them your head is and then you put in a bad terrible earth-shaking 
adjective. We don't choose that anymore. Your life is like when we're talking to someone, we don't choose those words anymore. We don't point at them and look at them and use those. We know that we don't know those evil words. We don't choose them anymore. We know the evil action. We don't practice them because we make ourselves simple, ignorant of evil. That's when verse 20 will now come in in our lives. Verse 20, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Yeah. It's when we obey verse 19. And that obedience is there as an evidence of our salvation. As an evidence of our sanctification. As our evidence of total submission and surrender unto the Lord. It is when that is there and we have that unqualified uninterrupted obedience to the Lord that is when we have the experience of verse 20 that the God of peace shall grow Satan under my feet shortly under my feet shortly under your feet shortly in Jesus name we're coming now to verse 26 in verse 26 but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known unto all nations for the obedience of faith the obedience of faith faith will not work except it has obedience incorporated into that faith it's the obedience of it i believe i believe i believe do you obey it's when obedience goes along with that faith that that faith will be dynamic and that faith will function very well it is for the obedience of faith amen amen, amen for our church Amen for everyone in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at the conferred privilege. The conferred privilege of covenant keeping believers. The people who believe in the Lord and they show it. They believe in the Lord and they have the evidence of that faith in the Lord. The privilege that comes on them and the privilege that is conferred upon them. Look at Genesis chapter 22 we're reading from verse 17 that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying i will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies why on what grounds look at verse 18 it says in verse 18 and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because 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 it's not because you know that's what god said they will do whether you are right or wrong i'll still do it whether you are up or down i'll still do it whether you are right whether you are righteous or righteous i'll still do it no it says this i will do because thou hast obeyed my voice because thou hast obeyed my voice look at psalm 91 in psalm 91 we're reading from verse 7 a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand but it shall not come near thee Amen. You know, for the children of Israel, millions of them, they came out of Egypt, not one person feeble among their tribes. How? And it says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Why? 
there is a because there's a reason why look at our look at our church even this service and look at all our brethren here in lagos in all the districts and look at all the states and all the regions and all the congregations and look at how many they are and think of them no evil no sickness no infirmity and no destruction coming upon anyone this year in jesus name is it possible i said is it possible if we fulfill his condition a thousand of outsiders shall fall by thy side and ten thousand of religious formal traditional worshippers ten thousand at the right hand but it shall not come merely in verse 8 it says in verse 8 only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked in verse 9 it says because 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 thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge even the most high thy habitation you have made the lord the bridegroom our savior our provider you have made him our shepherd your habitation now let, let's say for example your husband was physically with you and then there's uh, one refrain one person somewhere coming to make advances to you and your husband is there looking at you and you're looking at your husband even a sinner generally generally would a sinner sinning woman yield to that person that is asking for the lust of the flesh while the husband is there they are not talking not to talk of a believer now, if the Lord is really there, your habitation, if your shepherd is also there, your habitation, if you're conscious that your husband, the bridegroom, is there, and all these people having the works of the flesh, and they're making advances to you, if you're conscious that the Lord is present there physically, will you respond? Tell me. But you know, if a so-called believer is yielding to whatever, works of the flesh, activities of sin, and is doing things that should not see the light of day, he has not made the most high his habitation. And because he has not made the Lord his habitation, and he's acting as if God does not exist, the man is an atheist. The woman, church man, church woman, is an atheist. He doesn't believe that God sees what he's doing. He knows the word of God in the head, but he doesn't have the heart to be obedient to the Lord. He has not made the Lord the most high his habitation. That's why those things are happening. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any play come near the dwelling. In verse 12, it tells us in verse 12, it says, They shall bear thee up in their hands. Lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Are you following? Yeah. Evil or the devil has placed a stumbling block and you're walking and walking if you're obedient to the lord if you're a child of god you may not see that stumbling stone but the lord has seen that stumbling stone and because you obey him and because you make god your habitation he will send his angel before you get to that stumbling block the angels will lift you up but if you are disobedient if you are rebellious, if you are sinful, if you are habitually unrighteous and the stumbling block is there that you might stumble, 
your health might go, your property might be lost. God sees the stumbling block there, but the condition he gave, you are not obeying. And you are just walking here, there, and backsliding, sinning, or unrighteous, and all that. He will not send his angel. It is because we obey him. It is because we trust his word. It is because we obey his word implicitly. That's what he said then. If you're obedient and you make the Lord your habitation, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against this. So look at verse 13. In verse 13, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. Young lion, the young lion, and the dragon, thou shalt trample on the feet. Then in verse 14, it says, because, look at that, because, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him, therefore, because he sets his love upon me. And because if you love somebody, you will regard him, you will honor him, you will obey him, we'll obey out of love. If we don't obey and we just say, I love you, I love you, I love you, that one, that one is just what? That one is not real. It says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him, I will set him on high because it very quickly it tells us i'm saying this to the people who honor him i'm saying this to the people who obey god i'm saying this to the people who reverence and respect him he says because he has no not my name then in verse 15 it says he shall call upon me and i will answer that's the covenant the people the people who are obedient to the word of God and the people who honor the Lord and honor the word of God, they are the people that he has from. It's not just every dick and Harry. This one is you know, doing the smoking, that one is doing their drinking, that one is doing their stealing, that one is doing their adultery, that one is uh, doing their fornication. Even in the new year, that one is doing the messing up everywhere. And then it comes Covenant Sunday, Covenant Sunday, we're going to pray and the Lord is going to answer. Wait a minute. He says, because you set your love upon him, because you make him your habitation, because you're obedient to him, and because you're born again, and you show the evidence of being, of being born again. He said, because of that, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will honor deliver him and honor him somebody shout amen, amen. psalm 25 uh, sorry i say chapter 56 and i'm reading from verse 4 i say chapter 56 verse 4 thus says the lord unto the eunuchs that keep my sabbaths unto the eunuchs every eunuch no that keep my sabbaths and choose the things that please me thus says the lord to the people that choose the things that please me the things that please the lord the things that exalts the lord the things that forgets about self and then you honor the lord with your life with your obedience it says thus says the lord unto the universe that keep my sabbath and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant and then he tells us in uh, the next uh, verse there he tells us in verse uh, five it says in verse five even unto them will i give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than the sons all of daughters i will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off those are the people that choose the things that 
please the Lord. Those are the people all that will have the irreversible blessings of God upon their lives. We're looking at um, First Kings chapter eleven, and I'm reading from verse nine. First Kings eleven, reading from verse nine, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because because that the Solomon is said you have asked the things that please me because of that I'll make you rich because of that I'll set you on high because of that I'll do this and I'll give you wisdom that no king before you has ever had and even people after you you'll be special because your prayer pleased me but now the Lord, that same God that was happy with him, that same God that blessed him, that same God that promoted him, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Look at the favor Abraham, uh, that Solomon had had and look at the relationship and the interaction between him and the Lord look at the great blessings the Lord had given him but now he took things for granted wisdom that he had knowledge that he had favor that he had blessings that he had now the Lord had given him blessings but now as he took everything for granted and went to marry strange wives and followed after their gods and their idols, King Solomon. And because of all that he did and his riches, he used his money, spent his money to build for the gods and the idols of those concubines. It says now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was torn from the Lord, the God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Some people think the love of God is unconditional. They think he loves you, loves you forever. Fall into the ditch, he loves you forever. Go into the far country, he loves you forever. Help and age idol worshippers to worship their idols, he loves you forever. And take the people who are disobeyed, denying God, publicize them, he loves you forever. He doesn't work that way. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice in verse 10 verse 10 then tells us and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods but he kept not that which the lord commanded and then now he tells us in verse 11 in verse 11 it says wherefore the lord said unto solomon solomon come i want to talk to you solomon for as much as this is done of thee and thou hast not kept my covenant conditional covenant solomon you of all people wise intelligent rich and you have the strength to do this and you can read you can write and i commanded you this and look at the direction you are going it says you have not followed my covenant and my statutes which i commanded thee i will surely rent cheer take away the kingdom from thee and will give it unto thy servant one servant he had a servant that was good sharp intelligent forthright and powerful and so the lord said he's he had the ability to rule the nation even though it's your servant i'm not going to give everything now to you i'm going to give part of that kingdom unto thy servant what did solomon do the solomon say okay it's god i'm sorry 
I caused this for myself. I'm sorry that I'm losing my privilege. I repent. We don't know what God would have done if he had repented. What he do? Look at verse 40. In verse 40, Solomon sought, therefore, therefore, because God had pointed to him that, look at that your servant, because of what you have done, because of disobedience, and because of your rebellion, I'm going to give part of, that, of the kingdom to that servant. Therefore, Solomon sought to kill Jeroboam. He said, ah, that's the one God you are mentioning. Okay, before you allow him to rule and take my place, I will kill him. And that's not the attitude we are to have. When God is correcting us and is saying my covenant is still there, my promises are still there, but you are losing it because of this and because of that. Okay, now I'm going to put that person in your place. And if that is the case, I'll kill that man. I'll dribble him. I'll torture him. I will make him to even forget how to use his intelligence. I might not be able to kill him physically, but I'll kill him psychologically. I kill him spiritually. I use whatever they use to you know, confuse the man. How are you going to do that? Look, that's what Solomon did. It says, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt. God, I want to accept the promise to be a king. Like you said, you'll give to him, but the man wants to kill me and he ran away. How do you, how do you send people away from the church? They are coming to be blessed by God to do that and then you do your maneuvering and then you send them away, they run away from the church and there's a man that you know, knew the Bible knew the word of God, knew the promises of God and knew the covenant of God what's your goal, what are you doing, why are you in the church, that the people that should do this and do that you have something, to, you have you know, conspiracy and whatever and then they run away from the church we shouldn't do that, it did not benefit so Solomon. And then you say that man was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Solomon did not reconcile with God after God said, you're not keeping my covenant. You're not obeying me. This is what I said I will do. I told David, if your children will walk after me, I will make of their children to take over the throne. Solomon, you spoiled the whole covenant. And I'm angry with you. And the man did not repent. He was in that anger, pursuing the servant to kill that servant until he died, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain all the knowledge, all the authority, all the power on earth and lose his own soul? In John chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 31. John chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 31. It tells us, it said, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if that's the condition. We believe in him now if, and it says, if he continue in my word, then shall he be my disciples indeed. What are the words of Jesus? Anyone that will humble himself like this little child shall be exalted if he continue in my word. Anyone that exalts himself will be abased if you continue in my word and if you are bringing your gift to the altar you remember that somebody has ought he gives you leave your gift at the altar it's not about activity about duty about this and that leave your gift go reconcile what's your brother who has something good that's christianity that's the word of christ it says if you continue in my word blessed are the pure in heart not the people that are you know kind of uh, money doing this and doing that pure in heart for they shall see the Lord that's the word of the Lord except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees he shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven that's the word of Christ if you continue in my word ye hypocrites you appear righteous externally but inwardly you're ravening wolves that's the word of Christ are we going to remain in hypocrisy all our lives what are we trying to achieve? It says, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If 
ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And in verse 32, and it says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Ye shall know the truth. Why doesn't the truth make us free? Because we know the truth in the head, not in the heart. We know the truth, we learn the truth, we hear the truth, we increase in the knowledge of the truth. Why doesn't it change our lifestyle? Why doesn't it bring a life that is shining for the glory of God? We know that truth in the head, we have not transferred it to our hearts. And we're not looking for transforming truth. And our lives are not transparent. If we really know the truth in our heart, if we know the truth and we're devoted to the truth, and we're not devoted to tradition, we're not devoted to you know what people want us to do. If we really knew the truth, the truth will make us free. It will make us free this year in Jesus' name. Even if we do less, less. If you have been doing 10 things, sweating, walking, putting all your strength, all your skill into it, 10 things, but it's on the platform of hypocrisy, lying, deception, jolting other people, deceiving other people, destroying the lives of other people, scattering the families of other people. You're doing 10 things. All those 10 things, they mean nothing to God. But we know the truth now. What is important is my heart to God, my life to God, my devotion to God, my transparency before God. And even if I do less, I do six things, I drop one, two, three, four. Because much of those things, if they had been like just wanting recognition, I drop them. I do less. The less that you do in transparency of life, the less that you do in a life that is acceptable in the sight of God, will be so much blessed for you and for the people you are ministering for. That's why this year we are not looking at activity, 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 and the hypocrisy is falling out of the activity. The righteousness is underneath the activity. The insincerity is underneath the activity, and the destruction of other people's lives following the activity. Stop that, stop that, and do less. And then when you do that less in truth, and you do that less uh, number of things in total transparency unto God and you remember God in everything you do the blessings for people that you are ministering to because the spirit will back up the, what you are doing the power will back up what you are doing the anointing will back up what you are doing you become free you make other people free and everybody will enjoy the blessings of the Lord in their lives in Jesus name ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you tell me free look at point number three here point number three we're looking at the courageous prayer of all covenant keeping beneficiaries as i told you earlier prayer is very important but prayer is not the key the prayer of faith the faith that stems out of obedience that the prayer that the key, not every prayer. When we pray, and underneath that prayer, there is obedient heart. Underneath that prayer, there's a sincere heart. Underneath that prayer, there is a focused heart on the honor of God. That's the prayer God recognizes. We're looking at First Kings chapter 8. Chapter 18, verse 21. First Kings 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long? All ye between two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow him. 
But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Elijah came and said, three years of famine have come and gone. We're well, the fourth year of famine. And that fourth year of famine, about half of the year has gone already. And now we're still like this. Look at the famine. Look at the suffering. Look at the death. Look at the sicknesses. Baal has not helped the nation. Your hypocritical service has not helped the nation. Your disobedient life has not helped the situation now. If God be God, let's follow him. And if Baal, follow him. They couldn't answer. And then uh, Elijah made a proposal. Let these prophets of Baal, let them take up a bullock and pray, but not put fire. And then I will do my own. Whichever God brings the fire, that the God we are going to serve. I didn't hear you. And so those, you know the story already. I don't need to read it to you. Those uh, people, they did all they wanted to do. They caught themselves. They shouted. They ran and all. Nothing happened. So Elijah said, come aside. And then he set the altar right. He said, put water. They put water. The water that should not even allow the fire to come up. And now a courageous prayer. He said, God, the God of heaven, I come because of these people. And before he finished the prayer, the fire came down. A courageous prayer. Nobody had ever prayed a kind of prayer like that before in the whole Bible. And yet this man had the courage to pray that kind of prayer and God answered the prayer. If we're obedient to the Lord, saved and sanctified, our prayers will be answered. After that, he dealt with the, um, those people, false prophets. Then he told Ahab, he said, prepare your chariot. And this man Elijah, courageous prayer, what rivers, showers, rain that had not come for three and a half years. He prayed and then told the servant, go and see. The servant said, I see nothing. Why didn't you see anything? Are you one of those people that don't believe? Go and see again. He came back the third, the seventh time. He said, now I can see. This year, you will see the hand of God. Fire came. The rain came, courageous prayer. Look at the next one there. That's in First Samuel. I'm reading from chapter 7, verse 8. The people of Israel, they had gone away from the Lord again. And the children of Israel said unto, unto Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it tells us, and Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord of, for Israel. And the Lord heard him. The Lord will hear him. Look at verse 10. It says, when the Lord heard him, and as Samuel was offering up, the burnt offering. The Philistines drew near to battle against, against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them and there was meeting before Israel. You lost your amen. Samuel prayed. And all those Philistines, they had the ammunitions and the weapons and everything. Look at Israel, almost like having nothing. But just pray. courageous prayer that Samuel prayed. Immediately, the Lord sent his thunder, scattered those people, and destroyed those people. God can do that again. He says, I am God, I change not. Why do we pray, pray and pray? An ordinary headache is not healed. 
point will we pray, pray, and pray? And ulcer has continued for six, seven years, and the ulcer is still there. When do we pray, pray, and pray? And this one is dying of cancer. That one is becoming blind at a young age. That one is having leukemia, you know, at young age. And we pray, pray, and pray, and we fast, and things are not happening. They are happening everywhere. They are happening where we go. They are happening on the side there. I can tell you, you know, testimonies of things happening that you didn't even hear about because after the crusade, they sent back to me and they say, this happened, this happened, this happened. Even to people in other places, in other religions, spectacular things and special things and spiritual things and supernatural things happening everywhere. But we at home, let's talk to ourselves. Are we going to continue like this? What's in our hand? What's in our lives? And what's uh, happening to us that all these good things are happening to other people and uh, when we go there just once in a while and over here it appears that the skies are sealed it's because we have not responded to the word of god like we ought to things will change in our prayer life so that as we are obedient to the Lord while we are yet speaking like Samuel he'll send the thunder it will disperse all those demons in Jesus name I was looking at Isaiah chapter 37 and I'm reading from verse 21 Isaiah chapter 37 verse 21 then Isaiah the son of Amos sent unto Ezekiah saying thus says the Lord God of Israel whereas thou hast prayed unto me against Sinachero the king of Assyria. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, there is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised thee. And the daughter, and he says, and latch thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at you. Look at verse 36 now. In verse 36, it says, Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote the camp of the Assyrians, and hundred and four score and five thousand, one hundred and eighty-five thousand enemies, soldiers, and to the teeth. But because of the simple prayer, courageous prayer, spectacular prayer of Isaiah, the Lord now sent the angel of the Lord. And it says in the last line, and when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Amen. That king had written a letter to Ezekiah and said, Don't say you are depending on God. Are you depending on prayer? Depending on this, on that. See what I did to this. See what I did to that. The man even became afraid. The king of Judah, he became afraid. And then he prayed, he fasted. And then Isaiah said, Go tell Ezekiah. This is a simple matter. Because of obedience, and because of yieldedness to the covenant of the Lord and because your heart depends on me without looking here and there I'll deal with him on your behalf the Lord will deal with them on your behalf but you must not be like them looking at them, thinking of them fearing for them and you must not be like them trembling for them Whatever they do, look at your God and pray the courageous prayer and say, Lord, here is what you have promised. And this year, the thunder of heaven will come upon your enemies in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 12. We're reading from verse 5. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made 
without ceasing of the Lord unto God for him. Peter, the forefront apostle. James already gone, and Herod thought Peter is next. And he will not escape this. And so he put him in prison. The day he was to touch him, bring him out, kill him, destroy him, forget about him, and scatter the church. Herod is not powerful enough to scatter the church. Upon this rock, I build my church. And the gates of hell, not only one gate, all the gates of hell, with Herod, with Pharaoh, with Pilate, everyone shall not prevail against the church. The church that runs the agenda of God cannot be destroyed by men on earth that have earthly agendas. And a Christian that follows the agenda of God will not be destroyed by any man, any woman, any group of people having a human agenda in Jesus' name. Peter therefore was kept in prison but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And then we're reading there from verse 7. In verse 7, Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter, is to wake him up, not to kill him. Smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Understand, Peter was chained to soldiers. Those soldiers were supposed to be watching him so he doesn't ex escape. And the chain made of iron rings, if anybody moves, that the chain will make sound. And because they are chained, chained on this side, chained on that side, there's no way he could have escaped. But the angel came and smote him, tapped him, and he woke up, and the chain chains, plural, fell off from his hands. The soldier here did not hear the sound of the chain. The soldier here did not hear the sound of the chain. And then they didn't sense any movement. And the angel said, put on your sandals. He put on his sandals. And they didn't wake up. And the chain in their hand became heavier because the chain was now only in their hands. That didn't affect them. They kept on sleeping. That's how they kept on sleeping. And then the angel said, come on. And then he came. But there is God, you know God, you know what they do. One standing at that door, one standing at and they're fully armed, anything. Even if a rat passes, that soldier is there or kill the rat. But as Peter and the angel got to the door, the door opened by itself. Amen. The padlock opened. Everything they have padlocked before you were opened up to you. And then the door, iron door, iron door, the iron door opened and Peter went out and he came to the second iron door and again it opened automatically. Heaven does not need the key to that padlock. It's the creator of all things and that padlock will open in Jesus name. The enemy might have locked you up. And then they have guards that intimidate with everything they have. 
And as you are to come out, just looking at their faces will make you shrink and will make you turn back and say, Angel, go. I prefer to stay in this dungeon than see those angels, than see those uh, people, those girls, and look at what they have in hand. The Lord will close their eyes to you. And the Lord will close your eyes to them. The second gauge, they came and they passed on. I am moving on. I am moving on. And then Peter realized this is deliverance. He thought he was dreaming. This one is not a dream. What will happen in your life this year? Good, good things. You will think you are dreaming. It will not be a dream. It will be reality in Jesus' name. Then he came out that same chapter. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, that same chapter 12, upon his search day, Herod, that the one who imprisoned Peter, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon the throne and made an oration unto them. Verse 22. In verse 22, and the people gave a shout. That's what the people do. They praise the bad man. They humiliate the good man. They exalt the destroyer. And they destroy the developer. That's what they do. The world has not changed. And they said, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. Verse 23 and immediately the angel of the Lord, the angel that delivered Peter out of that dungeon, that same angel come back, came back now, the angel of the Lord smote him, he smote Peter, and Peter arose. He smote Herod, the same hand. Herod gave up the ghost because he gave not God the glory and he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost. The angel of the Lord is there. For you, he will act positively. And the angel of the Lord is still there. For them, he will act destructively. We're looking at chapter 13 of Acts. Acts chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 3. In verse 3, and when that fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Look at verse 8. As they sent them away, they went in ministry. And the ministry they went for now, in verse 8, and Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, we stood them. You know, there are people, they don't fear anybody, fear Barnabas or fear Paul. They don't fear any preacher, any pioneer, anyone. They are just bold to their destruction. It says this in Limas, a sorcerer. When somebody is doing evil and is able to do that evil for a long, long time, and people don't even realize, the deputy did not realize, this man has another subterranean power and he hindering him from getting life eternal. Why don't you understand that there are people like that, they have this power underneath, occultic, evil, sorcery. It says the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation. And his action is also like that. We stood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. And then in verse 9, here's what we are talking about. Courageous prayer. And here it was the first time of Paul and Barnabas on the field where they went. And yet when this 
evil man with evil spirit with evil power with evil intention with evil agenda when he confronted them were told then Saul who is also called Paul filled with the Holy Ghost set his eyes on him you know many believers the first thing you do is somebody has you know that kind of occulty power that kind of evil power that kind of spiritual power that kind of gang uh, power if they have that and you happen to know and they are in oppression they're in oppression then you you drop your head you only what to I do your head is scattered you are confused or well, you have the spirit of God and you're obedient to God and you are partakers of the benefits of the covenant you look straight and you look at them and the fire from the spirit in you will burn off the power in them in Jesus name. it says then Saul who is called Paul filled with the Holy Ghost set his eyes on him and then in verse 10 it says and said O full of all subtlety and all mischief thou child of the devil that's how you pray when you're praying courageous prayer you don't you know parambulate and say this one say it that way as if you're afraid to say the right thing I don't want them to hear what I have in mind and then God understands that then you pray a kind of prayer that has no energy and no spirit no punch in any life it says thou child of the devil thou enemy of all righteousness will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord then in verse 11 he says and now behold the hand of the Lord is upon thee and thou shalt be blind Paul you are coming here for the first time and you're talking to a man thou shalt be blind what if you didn't become blind what if God does not answer that kind of prayer? Would he not say that you are, you know, you don't have power? This man has power. Be careful how you deal with the situation. Look at Paul. This is what, why we call it courageous prayer. The courageous prayer of all covenant keeping beneficiaries. It said, Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season and immediately. That's how God will answer your prayer. Immediately. I said that's how God will answer your prayer. We have more power if we're obedient to the Lord, if we're saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. We have more power than those people hiding in the village and they're trying to throw something spiritually, you know, across the seas and they're trying to throw to anybody here before it gets there to return to them. It says immediately they are fell on him a mist and in darkness. And they went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. I hope you understand. The man lost his sight immediately. The man lost his job immediately. He went out. He couldn't stay with the deputy anymore without even disengaging him and without stopping his service there. No use again. Number one, he has lost his power. He has lost his occultism. He has lost his sight. He lost his job. And he lost the respect he used to have from the deputy. That man used to look at him up there as the power that be. It is lost everything. All those people that try to fight against anyone standing in, in the covenant blessing of the Lord, they will lose everything they have got. And then he went out seeking some to lead him by the hand look at verse 12 in verse 12 then the deputy when he saw what was done believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord we're looking at Psalm 50 in Psalm 50 we're reading from verse 5 Psalm 50 reading from verse 5 it's talking about the people that God is calling he wants them to gather together unto him and to offer a prayer that will not be denied in Psalm 50 verse 5 it says gather my saints not sinners not backsliders 
not hypocrites, not people who are playing religion, not traditional people without the real uh, evidence of salvation and following the Lord. It says, gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant, a covenant with me by sacrifice. Not those who come with empty hands, no sacrifice, empty heart, no surrender, empty life, no submission, empty perception, and no, no yieldedness unto God. Gather my saints unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice let's look at verse 15 in verse 15 and call upon me in the day of trouble and i will deliver thee 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 and thou shalt glorify me look at verse 16 but unto the wicked but unto the people who remain habitually sinners, but unto the worshippers who will not change anything, but unto the people praying, 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 prayer, 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 prayer is the key, but their lives will not turn around, but unto the wicked, God says, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. Wicked, sinful, backsliding, will not return, will not repent, will not make restitution, will not turn around their lives to follow the path of righteousness. It says, what hast thou to do that thou sh shouldest take my covenant? covenant in thy mouth look at verse 17 in verse 17 seeing thou hatest instruction you're only looking for bread and butter thou hatest instruction you're only looking for money thou hatest instruction you're only looking for physical external blessing thou hatest instruction and casteth my words behind thee everything we've heard they cast that behind them covenant month covenant month we're going to pray what have you got to do with prayer and covenant when you cast my words behind thee verse 18 in verse 18 when thou sawest a sea then thou contendest with him and has been partaker with adulterers. When you see thieves, they are looking for where to hide their booties. Oh, we say, I'm here. And then you put the thing there. Thieves, they want, they want to put the money you have stolen in one account. They'll never discover this. Put it in my account. And then you look at all those things. And then it says, the adulterers who are partakers of them. And you know, they get their money through adultery, fornication, and prostitution. And then you get the money. And it's offering. And it's offering. I don't care where they get the offering. I'm here. You can put the money there. If you can put, you know, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million and then God will bless you. And then, but you know what they are doing. You know where they are getting the money and the resources from the dog shall not come into the sanctuary of the Lord. And then you done all that and then you are praying, praying, praying. God says, stop the prayer. What kind of God do you think I am? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God in heaven. We must appreciate the nature of God, which is the nature of holiness. And not just bringing money. What's, what's money going to do? A sinner bringing money for us to use to save sinners. And he himself remains a sinner and is coming every month, every year, and is not saved. It's not making restitution is still doing the evil thing was doing her, and the sinner is bringing the money so that we can use the money to save uh, the lost. That doesn't, uh, God doesn't uh, respect that. In verse 19, verse 19 it says, Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit.
seat lying in verse 20 it says thou sittest and speakest against thy brother thou slanderest thine own mother's son in verse 21 it says these things thou hast done and I kept silence and thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as such an one as thyself but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Look at verse 22. Now consider this. Ye that forget God. Mention in the name of God, you forget God. Come into the service without straightening it out your life, aligning your life with the word of God, you forget God. Doing the same old rebellious or righteous sinful habitual things like you did before you're still doing them in the new year it says ye that forget God consider this lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver verse 23 in verse 23 who so offereth praise glorifies me and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God the blessing of God the goodness of God the fulfillment of the promise of sins of the covenant of God it will show us as we turn to him fully and totally completely with all our heart with all our soul with all our mind and we love him without any reservation even from today in Jesus name in Jesus name and then we we'll think of all the things the Lord himself has taught us all these many years everything we've heard that we have dropped by the wayside and we're no more obeying the word of God we're just living in nominal shallow life we're no more deeper life we're no more higher life spiritual life and the life has now become shallow and superficial and it's from day to day even to the new year we now want to talk to the Lord and say Lord I realize you can't repent for another person just like you cannot breathe for another person you cannot drink water on behalf of another person anybody going to breathe to remain alive is going to breathe by himself anyone that is going to eat so as to uh, you know, solve the hunger problem is going to eat for himself anyone who is going to repent who is going to turn around who is going to follow after the Lord and begin a new life in Christ has to do that for himself and the Lord has said anyone that will now glorify him and order his conversation aright, he will show the fullness of the blessing of the salvation of the Lord. I believe it will start from you. I said it will start from you. Rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer, not hypocritical prayer, a prayer of conviction, a prayer in confidence, a prayer in courage, a prayer that stands on the word of God, that obeys the word of God, and then he says, it will answer from heaven. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.